Dr. Keckler, right? Am I saying that correct? You are. All we right. are live on YouTube. You. Okay, perfect. And we're on our site, we can go. All righty, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank all of our council members, chairpersons and staff who are on the Zoom tonight. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by the New York State Division of Human Rights and the US Army Corps of Engineers, New York District. For our first presentation, we will hear from Dr. Olivia Cackler. Dr. Cackler serves as the plan form formulation branch chief for the US Army Corps of Engineers, New York District. Dr. Kakla has 20 years of experience with the Army Corps in planned formulations for flood risk reduction and ecosystem restoration projects. She's also a believer that the best Queens neighborhood is Ridgewood. All right, I don't have any, I love all of you the same. The US Army Corps released a draft feasibility report detailing the rationale behind the identification of the tentatively selected plan for the NYNJ HAT study. Tonight's presentation is an overview of the plan, plan details to facilitate public review for the comment period, which closes on March 7, 2023. And I couldn't think of a more important time to continue to, to have these conversations uh, around addressing gray and green infrastructure in Queens. I don't have to remind any of you of Hurricane Sandy, Ida, uh, and so many more that have caused uh, re uh, major devastation on our borough. And I don't know about y'all, although we do enjoy these 50 degree days, uh, we are going to pay for it. <laughs> um, so I'm always uh, cognizant of, of the fact that the nicer the weather is, I, I can't remember if we got any snow, maybe we got a few flurries this winter, that uh, this certainly is going to have an impact uh, on our borough as we continue to move forward. So I'm very happy and pleased um, to have the Army Corps tonight. I want to thank them for the work that they did, uh, in particular in shoring up uh, the beachfront in the Rockaways. I know they'll talk uh, about the Bayfront and obviously other neighborhoods from Howard Beach to Hamilton Beach to Western Queens, all of the challenges. We continue to see Corona, East Elmhurst uh, around flooding, um, and I look forward to the work ahead with them, uh, especially as we enter EULA process. But I do want them to stress the importance of um, folks uh, putting their comments in during this comment period, um, which is important as, as well. So I want to thank you, Dr. Kackler, for joining us, and you now may take it away. Thank hey, you, Borough President Richards. Borough um, President Sanders, uh, if, I, if I can, just, and, and everything is frozen on me, so uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that everybody's still listening and uh, we're good to go, right? Yes. Okay, yep. great. I, I just want to intro this a, a little bit. Uh, this is Cliff Jones, um, the chief of planning division here at New York District. And th this is very important to us. This study that we're doing with New York, New Jersey Arbor and tributaries, also known as the HATS study, is one of the major focuses within the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, and, and definitely within the New York District. It's a huge, comprehensive study that we're doing to look at the challenges that New York has faced uh, in recognition of what happened during Hurricane Sandy. Um, I, I like to say uh, at least three things that, that become important for this. One, it's a, it's a recognition um, and, and a kind of reminder that the threats are real. Uh, we deal with the, the threats from coastal storm risk uh, constantly. And I know the folks out in Jamaica Bay uh, know this um, from the larger storms, from the smaller, more frequent events. Um, and we're trying to reconcile that within uh, the areas within Jamaica Bay, as, as, as well as Northern Queens, as well as the entire New York uh, metro area. Um, the other thing that, that is definitely important is that, yes, we put out a draft report, and many people have seen that and, and got a chance to review. Uh, the report is on our website. Uh, there's there's uh, versions of it that make it easy uh, to read pieces of uh, what, what you want to get at. Um, and there's a story map that goes with that. So you can use that story map and basically go to any area that you want 
and, and see how the project might might impact you or, or your area. Um, our team has done a tremendous job getting those pieces together and trying to make it easily accessible uh, to the general public. And the third thing, definitely, as you pointed out, we want to use this as an opportunity um, as, as we've extended the public comment period, which is normally just a 30 day period. Uh, we knew it was going to be a little bit more uh, focused and, and visible to a lot more. So we, we had originally put it out for two months. And based on some requests, we put it out for an additional uh, two months. So that period ends March 7th uh, from uh, back in September when we initially released the report. Um, we're, we're looking to use an opportunity like this. And uh, Borough President, I, I really appreciate you using the opportunity and uh, giving us this platform because uh, we want to use every platform that we have to get the word out that there's a report out. The report has a plan in it. Uh, that, doc that documents what we've looked at from all of the other alternatives and how this plan is the most feasible from the economic perspective, the environmental perspective, and the engineering perspectives in reducing the risk of coastal storms in the future. Um, so we look forward to getting back comments from, from that wide audience as we move ahead. Uh, and again, just appreciate the opportunity. I'm gonna let Dr. Cackler talk about uh, some of the details in, in the plan now over here. Thank you, Claire. And um, all of you on this call, please call me, call me Olivia. That's, I'm much more comfortable with that. Um, I'd, I'd like to share, uh, I've got a few slides. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. Uh, but before I go into it, I just like to point out that also on this call, we have a few members uh, from the Army Corps planning team including uh, Danielle Tomaso, who's the lead planner on, on the study. So she's, yes, yes. And she's gonna have to jump off early because there is a virtual public meeting that the team is holding tonight at six o'clock. And so for that reason, I'm gonna give you a 15 minute overview instead of the usual one hour presentation. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Are you able to see the screen now? Uh, there's a PowerPoint on it. Thank you, sir. Um, so as Cliff explained, uh, this is a, we're here to talk about the HATS study, Harbor and Tributary study. I'd like to point out that the Army Corps has partnered with the states of New York and New Jersey on the study and the city of New York is a key stakeholder. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about which stage of the planning process we're in. I'm going to give you a little bit of detail about the parts of the tentative plan that are either in Queens or affect Queens. And then I'm going to share a few thoughts on how you can get the most out of your participation. All right. Uh, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I want to note a few important things for context. Uh, the details that you're going to hear about are preliminary and conceptual, and their details are subject to change based on new information and what we hear from you. Uh, a project has not yet been approved or funded for construction by Congress, New Jersey, New York, or local governments. So, Permittable actions or shovels in the ground are still far off. Uh, we're thinking that construction might start in 2030. So the graphic on the slide shows the Army Corps uh, study process and we are in the first box here, planning. So there's still a lot of work to do to get through design, construction, uh, and then into operations and maintenance. And what we're sharing today is a summary of what you can find in the draft um, integrated feasibility report and tier one environmental impact statement. I'm going to call that draft report for shorthand. Now, here is the web page. Here's the address where you can find a report. And the links to the report are on the left side of the page. We've also provided a, a reader's guide so that, um, because it's over 4,000 pages long, so you can go to the reader's guide first to figure out which parts of the report you want to go into detail on. 
Um, and as Cliff mentioned, we also have a story map, which is a GIS-based interactive hub so that uh, users can go to their specific um, address and figure, you know, and see where the closest project feature is. And then there's also without project and with project flood extents. Now, here is uh, one of our overview slides. Do not worry, I'm not gonna go through all the text, um, but this slide is to show you that we, this study includes the coastal and tidally influenced portions of New York and New Jersey Harbor, and it goes all the way up to Troy Lock and Dam on the Hudson River. So um, this slide is, and the overall presentation is available on the study webpage to download if you want to look at it in greater detail. Uh, the point of the slide is that our study area is very large. It's got over 2,100 square miles. So it is larger than the state of Delaware. And we have over 900 miles of shoreline to look at. And within the study area, we've got 16 million affected residents. Um, and as we saw during Hurricane Sandy, there is considerable risk to life safety from coastal storms. Now, at the present, we are focusing on coastal flood risk and how the project would perform under sea level rise. As uh, the borough president mentioned and Cliff mentioned, the draft feasibility report and tier one EIS was released in September of 2022 and the comment period closes March 7th. So uh, later on in this presentation, I'll share a few thoughts about what we consider effective comments. Uh, and just, just for your awareness, the study is approved to be completed by the end of 2024. All right, so future without project condition. Uh, one of the alternatives we have to look at is what will happen in the future if we, the Army Corps, don't do anything. And the future without project condition acts as the baseline for comparing the benefits and the costs uh, of the alternatives. You know. And um, so damages in the future without project condition, including sea level rise, are calculated for the period 2044 to 2093. And we started at the 2044 because we think a proposed project might be constructed and in place by 2044. Um, so there are three sea level rise scenarios that we have to consider. The historic, which is a continuation of what we've seen so far intermediate, which adds the warming and expanded volume of the oceans, and then the high scenario, which adds the melting of the ice caps. So the image that you're seeing on your screen is the intermediate scenario in the study area. Uh, in the draft report, we formulated against the intermediate scenario because then it's easier to pivot to the high scenario if that's what the data indicate. Uh, but we do provide the benefit calculations for the alternatives against all three scenarios in the draft report. Now, we also factor in this first bullet, existing federal, state, and local projects into our benefit calculations so that we don't double count benefits between an existing project and what we are proposing to do. All right, environmental justice. Uh, it is uh, definitely a priority for the current administration. And so we've been focusing a lot on environmental justice. As part of the tier one environmental impact statement, we conducted an analysis to identify the EJ communities within the study area and to determine whether the proposed um, actions would have a disproportionately adverse impact on these communities. Uh, for the Army Corps and its partners, this means trying to reduce the disparate environmental burdens, removing barriers to participation in decision-making and increasing access to benefits provided by projects such as this one. Now, when combined with environmental burdens and you know, the environmental justice criteria, the analysis identified 62% of census tracts within the study area as meeting the criteria for environmental justice. And as the study progresses, we're going to look into ways to refine this analysis based on meaningful feedback received from the communities who would be most affected by our tentative plan. All right, here we go. It's another super busy slide. Um, but here is an overview for the alternative 3B, uh, the tentatively selected plan. 
Before we go into the details on 3B, I should mention that we did consider a range of alternatives spanning the most comprehensive approach, which would be an outer harbor barrier about six miles long that would have benefited more than 95% of our study area. And on the other end of the spectrum would be a localized seawalls and flood walls located at the most vulnerable parts of our shoreline. And that would have covered 4% of our study area. So our analysis settled on 3B, which is in the middle of these alternatives and benefits about 63% of our study area. Now in this image, the blue lines are the features of 3B. The green areas are the areas that benefit from the presence of our project. And the red areas, they are they're not associated with a feature of our proposed plan with the blue lines. However, in some cases, they already have an existing Army Corps or state or local project, um, which is not captured on this graphic. We just we were trying not to make our graphic do too much because then it'd be even busier. Um, but this plan includes barriers at the entrance to Jamaica Bay, to Flushing Creek, and to Newtown Creek. And the barriers range in height from 17 to 20 feet North American vertical datum of 1988. There are also shore base measures, which consists of flood walls or sea walls, and those are projected to be about 10 to 20 feet in height above grade. Um, the, the gates and the walls, they're known as structural measures. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of, of housekeeping here. We have structural measures, and we have non-structural measures. When we say structural measures, we mean barriers or walls or some kind of storage that will change how frequently and how severely it floods. We're actually changing the, the way it floods. Um, these structural measures are complemented by non-structural measures in which the water continues to flow as, as it currently does. We do not change how frequently or severely it floods but we reduce the damages to property by either flood proofing or elevating properties so that the main living floor is um, out of the floodplain, basically, less likely to experience flood damage. And so with that, let's get into the Flushing Creek barrier. All right, so here is the Flushing Creek barrier, which spans, here we go, here on the red here, about 500 feet in the water with a vertical lift gate in the middle and an auxiliary lift gate on each side to maximize tidal flow. Uh, with that floodgate in the water, there are 11,000 linear feet of associated shore-based tie-ins to high ground, including flood walls and sea walls, vehicle gates, elevated promenades, and uh, flood walls of park. And the images on the right show the renderings of the existing conditions at the top and what the project would look like um, in that location. Now, the actual height and length for these components would be figured out in the next phase of this study. Uh, but we had to come up with some design assumption to be able to estimate how, uh, benefits and costs for the draft report. All right. So now let's look at the Newtown Creek Barrier. Um, the Newtown Creek Barrier is smaller. It's about 130 feet wide and it has 15,000 feet of shore-based tie-ins to high ground uh, going to elevation 17. Um, now the tie-ins consist, the, the shore-based tie-ins consist of flood walls and sea walls, levees, vehicular and pedestrian gates and elevated promenades Due to space constraints, it's unlikely that there's gonna be enough room for a flood wall of park like we saw at Flushing Creek. And the implementation of Newtown Creek Gate is going to be complicated because there are known contamination issues in the creek. Um, generally, the non-federal sponsors have to turn over a clean site for the Army Corps to be able to work. So that would definitely be a phased implementation. And also the wastewater treatment plant uh, may, may need some extensions for discharge so that discharge can get to the outside of the storm surge barrier. All right, and that takes us to 
the third gate, which is the Jamaica Bay gate, which had a high benefit to cost ratio, um, you know, of, of all the gates in the system. Uh, and before I go into some of the details, um, as you're looking, as you're trying to look at this slide, it helps to, to know two terms. One is induced flooding mitigation measure, which means that if the presence of the barrier or flood wall or seawall is going to cause water to build up outside of the project, which would affect nearby communities, we need to include mitigation features so that their flooding is not made worse by the presence of this project. So that's an additional cost um, that goes into our benefit cost ratio. Um, another term is residual risk feature, which consists of low walls or berms, which are built at the most vulnerable parts of the shoreline so that um, the barriers don't have to close that often. So that with these small uh, berms or flood, small berms or, 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 or walls, or even elevated, you know, raised bulkheads, then it's a twofold thing. So for like um, sunny day flooding, the barriers won't have to close. And in the event that there is a significant storm coming, then those residual risk features would buy those most vulnerable communities a little bit of time, you know, just just so that before the gates close, those gate those those residual risk features would be providing that measure of protection. Um, so, as uh, the slide points out, the residual risk features are behind the storm surge barrier. Here we go, right here on the top in the middle image here. And the induced flooding features are on the outside. So you can see here on the rockway, um, there is the induced flooding feature. Uh, again, this is a very busy image and we do recommend that you go to the story map because that will allow you to zoom in and get a better feel for how, how the project would affect you. And here is a rendering of what the Jamaica Bay storm surge barrier would look like. So you can see that there are two main sector gates in the middle here. And then on either side, there are multiple auxiliary gates to maximize tidal flow because of um, we, we're trying to minimize the environmental impact. All right. Now, uh, a few things I want to, to bring up. Uh, as stated earlier, there is an upcoming virtual public meeting today at 6, and it is located at um, Bryce, Bryce Wise-Miller's WebEx. So there is the address on the screen. Uh, if you can't make that because you're attending a meeting, then there are also upcoming future in-person public meetings at the Liberty Science Center, the New York Hall of Science, the Staten Island Borough Hall, the Rockaway YMCA, and also the Cardinal Hayes High School in the Bronx. Um, so for the in-person meetings, there are typically two, chefs, two sessions per day, one at two o'clock and one at six o'clock. And attendees will have the opportunity to look at poster boards, interact one-on-one -on -one with team, study team members, um, and any comments submitted at these public meetings become part of the study record. So the please send written comments for the record via email or mail, or if you show up in person uh, through the comment card and the comment period again closes on March 7th. Now I did want to also mention that when I say that it closes on March 7th, it's this, this phase of comments will be assessed for public feedback on the tentative plan, which informs the Army Corps and the non-federal partners decision to support the plan going forward. There are future opportunities after March 7th. This is not the last opportunity to comment uh, as the plan evolves over time. So here in my last slide, I'm going to talk about what we find uh, to be effective comments. So first of all, we do want to hear all comments, questions, concerns, and suggestions. Uh, what we find helpful is very specific comments. So if you have a concern about how the plan might affect you, it helps to have a specific like street intersection, like a 
location we can pinpoint for our tracking so that um, we can take that back to back to the engineers. Uh, it's also helpful when you state your point of concern to explain why you're concerned um, because this decision is also helpful to decision makers. And a lot of people, uh, when they send it in, you know, please don't assume that if you're concerned that you're the only one, you're probably not. And so uh, it helps to get that down. And we do share the, um, the comments. We do include the comments as, as part of our record, uh, which is available to our non-federal sponsors as well. And uh, we, do, uh, we do classify these comments and they will appear in the final report. Now, one thing that we have been concerned about is because this report was done at a very high level, um, as you saw, we're looking at areas that had a positive benefit cost ratio with flood walls that were 10 to 20 feet high. That's really big. And, you know, some places didn't pass the test at that level, but they're still at risk. And we think that there are many places throughout the study area that we could justify a smaller project. So if your area is not included, if you don't see it in draft report, please let us know that you want us to look at your neighborhood for either a smaller feature or potentially non-structural because we are looking for that information to inform the work that we have to do after the draft report. Well, uh, I think that about sums it up from, from me. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about, talk about the study and, um, and we look forward to receiving your comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Olivia, uh, for that presentation. And I guess I'll, I'll jump off the, the first question for me is, so I know you've done this in uh, New Orleans in Connecticut, correct? That yes, is, we, we had similar. Yeah. And um, can you just speak to some of the benefits, especially on the tidal flooding, which is something we continue to see across the borough, especially uh, in neighborhoods like the Rockaways to to um, to uh, Hamilton Beach, Howard Beach, and, and obviously in parts of Northern Queens. So uh, have they? Have you seen? I mean, what have the benefits been? Uh, in NOLA and certain communities, which are low lying areas as well with some of this infrastructure. My understanding is that in New Orleans and with the Stamford barrier up in Connecticut, that they have been very successful uh, in reducing the flood risk. What is interesting is that uh, once we build the project that turned over to the non-federal sponsors for operations and maintenance, and so the non-federal partners decide how frequently to use these gates to operate them. So would that be DEP, the equivalent, I'm assuming, or? or yeah, that to be determined. Yet, so yeah, you, yeah we, we haven't even gotten that far, President. But um, what's interesting is that, for instance, uh, the Stamford barrier, the, the New Orleans barriers, uh, they work. Uh, we heard from the folks in London with the Thames barrier that they use it way more frequently than the engineers have planned. Uh, so, you know, in addition to more wear and tear on, on the barrier itself, it, it means that whatever calculations they might've done on the effect on the environment, uh, they didn't anticipate, they didn't plan for that. I mean, that is something that we are discussing here that we need to uh, figure out a scenario where the barriers are closed much more frequently Mm -hmm. then we're calculating uh, to be able to communicate what the environmental effects would be of that. Okay. Uh, and I look forward to visiting. I know Cliff and I spoke about it and that, that visit, I think I'm going to do Connecticut first. So we'll be in touch for March-ish. You need to come out to see that. And then um, were there any impacts to those communities, I guess, as you put in the barriers? So I know um, for instance, you know, we're going to go through a EULA process here, correct? Um, and just wanted to know uh, what should we be looking out um, uh, for through this process? Maybe there's some things you encountered um, in Connecticut and then also in New Orleans that we should be aware of to prep ourselves for. So if you can just speak to that. 
I'm going to speak more generally than what happened in Stanford, New Orleans. But whenever we build a large project like this that benefit a lot of people, the effects, the adverse effects, are not equally spread out. I think that's the biggest uh, impact that we should be considering, that the people who are right up against the footprint of the tie-ins, the tie-offs with those barriers, they're going to be losing a lot more than the people who are a block behind, who are gonna benefit, you know, without having to say, give up some of their real estate or give up their view. There are definitely going to be view shed and access impacts that the communities need to consider and perhaps work out, you know, what is an equitable way to, to move forward for people who are going to be uh, getting the worst part you know, of the, of the implementation process. And then I, I would assume that you would work with the city, correct? Or the or a combination of the state and city, I'm assuming. Yeah, state okay. and city. Yeah, so I would yeah. just suggest you know, through the process, just making sure transparency is always key, right? More, as we get more information, the clearer you are up front, the more it arms us to be able to have conversations with the public and maybe some of these conversations will be hard conversations too. But, but you know, I just wanted to put that out there. And, and um, did you do any buyouts, I guess, I, I would assume, and in, in did you have to buy out anyone in NOLA or, or Stanford? It was that conversation around buyouts entertained, I guess. If you don't have the answer, that's fine. And, and, but, and, and, I, and I'll just, I, I'll just, I'll just say, and, and, and definitely, I, I will keep to my promise and try to hold true that we're, we're going to get you there. And maybe that, that answers a lot of the questions. But the buyouts weren't necessarily part of the, um, the barrier structures, but there were some in the process of making sure that. The, the comprehensive solutions did include a com combination of everything. So whether they were buyouts, elevations, uh, uh, some sort of protection, and that that's exactly what we're talking about here. And I, I do think, so that what you said before, I mean, it, I, I appreciate the fact that, I mean, the city and state have been tied with us through this whole thing. And I believe both are on this line now. So, so as we continue to work through this feasibility process, that's step one. Uh, the authorization gets to be the next step. And then uh, hopefully we do get to the process of getting uh, into that Euler process and getting into the detailed design so we can iron, iron a lot more of this out. Right. And um, just go back through your timeline on that again. So we're looking at about 2024 to wrap up this study. And this is the tier one analysis, what we should, what we should call it. The tier two analysis gets into be a little bit more detailed design, uh, which is another couple of years. Uh, but that also assumes that we, we get the authority that we need and the funding that we need to continue. Right. And then we get into detailed design, which puts us about into 2026. Uh, so that by about 20, 2030, uh, we can actually get started with some real construction. And there was some money set aside, correct? Am I wrong? Wasn't there 52 billion? No, 50, 52 billion is about the cost that we're looking at, okay, but it. none of that has been uh, appropriated yet. Yeah. Okay, got it. And I and I really like that you're looking at short-term and long-term solutions. So in some, you know, you can't use a one size fits all based on approach, based on what we've seen in Flushing and um, in other areas in Northern Queens as well. So really, I, I do like the idea of being strategic in the way we look at this and not using the one size fits all approach. All right, I'm gonna, uh, spoken enough, I'm gonna open it up uh, for questions. And I see Betty first. Thank you, Mr. Borough President, and thank you for your efforts for our pre-Christmas uh, present that we got in Howard Beach and Hamilton Beach. It was appreciated. Uh, less questions than comments. A couple of years ago, community leaders and our elected officials from uh, the Howard Beach area, we went to Stanford on a field visit to look and talk to the Stanford people. And we were very impressed with how that functioned. And we believe that that type of thing can function for our community. For my colleagues here on the board, Hamilton Beach has been seeing much more flooding 
in recent years that it has. It has always experienced flooding from major storms, but we're seeing much more flooding on a regular basis from smaller storms. The pre-Christmas storm this year was pretty much at the level of Hurricane Irene. Sandy was a whole nother story for our community. We had over 5,000 of our homes damaged and most of the homes that were damaged at that time did not have flood insurance because they weren't required to. They had never been flooded before. If you just look at the costs of storms like that, it's a huge number. If I just look at the storm that we had in Christmas, if 3,000 homes had you know, twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars worth of damage. You're talking about many millions of dollars. You know, and I speak to that from my own personal standpoint, where twenty-five thousand dollars is coming out of the public insurance fund for flood insurance. That had we had this type of system, would not be necessary. The the floodgate across Jamaica Bay's mouth is a good thing. We've met. The civic leaders from Howard Beach have met with some of the civic leaders in the Rockaways to try and, uh, you know, put together, you know, both sides of the bay into what the ramifications would be. On a conceptual level, my board and our community will be supporting the tentatively approved alternative. It bodes well for our community. With that, though, comes the caveat that the funding has got to be in place at some point to do this. You know, this this idea for that type of a gate has been kicking around since the 1960s. The title protection that this plan offers for Hawtree Basin and Shellbank Basin would protect our entire tidally inflect, affected areas from the types of storms we saw last month. You know, so it, it's really for us, it's the future of what our community will be down the road. Yes, it will mean changes, but they were changes we will have to come to terms with and we support it and we will be supporting it fully as this process moves forward. I would suggest that in terms of the funding, while at this particular point in time, the state of New York controls the majority leader's seat in the Senate of the United States and the minority leader in the House that we make the biggest push we can make to get the kinds of funding we need to get the study to advance and to get to some point where some of the components of this could be constructed faster than what the entire study predicts. So that's just my opinion. And I would urge my colleagues in the other parts of the borough to look at the things in their sections of the borough and that we come out at some point with a borough position on this. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Well said. We'll go to Danielle. Thanks. Um, so in full disclosure, the Army Corps came to our full board member meeting last week. Um, I have two questions. In the board meeting last week, it was met. So I'm in Western Queens in CB2, which is the Newtown Creek um, part of this. Um, so it came up in the board meeting last week that this work couldn't be done until the Newtown Creek cleanup that is underway and is going to be many, many more years to get done is done. So I'm wondering if that is in fact correct and um, how that sort of impacts this planning, because I think there's a, I think it's many decades of that cleaning that still has to happen. And second, and this is not in CB2's district, but I am wondering why, because um, the coastal area goes up through, you know, up into Astoria, why that, why it sort of only focuses on the Long Island City waterfront and seems to stop at the Queensboro Bridge, but I could be reading the plans wrong. Thank you. So I, I'll start to address, I'm sorry, Olivia. Um, I, I'll address the, the first and uh, I know you can get into the details. Um, so the on the um, the cleanup, I mean, it, it is our responsibility 
um, or our uh, our requirement, we 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 cannot get into an area unless it's clean. Um, so it, once it's whoever that uh, principal party is um, is required to do that cleanup before we can come in. But that doesn't stop us from recommending what could be done in areas. So we have the opportunity to finish out this feasibility study and make the recommendations with the understanding what needs to be done to actually implement those things. And having said that also, we can continue with getting the authority and put in place the elements that are clean uh, without having to wait until one site is clean before we do the entire project. Is that, if that makes sense, right? So, so there are elements that definitely we want to move forward with um, where, where we can. I mean, those, those, those uh, easy, if you will, solutions uh, before we wait until the whole thing is uh, ready to be done. The, the other uh, question, yeah, the, the, the intent was definitely and is definitely to look at the whole area comprehensively. Um, some of the areas that we, we saw that were subject to the, the, um, the higher, the, the, the more, um, um, the more infrequent storms, the, the sandy type storms, um, those, those were the focus of a lot of the barriers that we were talking about. Um, but there are definitely opportunities to look at those infrequently flooded areas. Um, and we have looked at the areas in Astoria and there are pieces that we're, we're looking to still tie in to those areas. Some, some of those pieces, we haven't developed the full strategies. We were focusing on the, the, uh, the barriers and some of the bigger solutions, but there definitely still are opportunities to look at um, non, non-structural elements, uh, na natural and nature-based features, um, some elements that would provide that, um, that address those residual risks, even with the barriers in place. You so want to add anything? identify it. Yes, that is exactly what we're looking for in the comment period. If you feel that this area is vulnerable and you're not seeing it reflected in our project features, please tell us to take another look. You know, and if you can be specific as to which part of the shoreline, that would be even better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Orr. Uh, good evening. I had uh, three questions. First, in terms of the funding on the state and city level, what percentage is there a, a established percentage that each level of government should be contributing to this project? And if so, what is the, the, the ask from the state and from the city? And then my second question, I don't know if you want all my questions at once. My second question is um, the location of the gate. I mean, it makes sense when you look at it from the big picture because it goes across all public property and you wouldn't affect uh, anyone, anyone's property, but it excludes and leaves Breezy Point and Roxbury vulnerable and the victims of the, um, the tide that's been held back from coming into the rest of the peninsula. Um, and so why can't it be positioned differently that it would protect those communities on our peninsula? And then the third question is, I'm, I'm so glad that um, Army Corps went to board tw uh, two, but when we requested board four, uh, when, when we requested Army Corps to come to Community Board 14, we were declined. So if you could explain that, thank you. I will try. Um, so the f and awesome questions. Uh, the first one on the cost sharing. Uh, mm -hmm. So for the feasibility study, um, this one, our, our feasibility studies are typically cost shared 50-50. And the state and 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 the city. I mean, we we've been working with them, but the the good news story on that, um, in a way, so the disaster uh, relief supplemental act gave us the opportunity to fund the study at 100% federally uh, funded. Uh, so okay. we're right now funding that uh, to completion. Um, once so we guess, finish. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to make sure my question was clear. I was talking more about the build, not about the study. Yeah, I I, fi I figured that was getting to yes. it too. So 
once we finish the study, the uh, the design will then be cost shared, and the design is typically cost shared at the same rate of construction. And the construction cost would be 65% federal, 35% non-federal. And as typically is done, New York State uh, ha has their cost sharing with New York City, okay. and they'll work out what those differences are. Okay, but the state uh -huh. and city would be responsible for 35% and the federal monies would come 65% of the cost. Correct. Okay. So on the second one, also an awesome question, and we've heard that before. And, and like Olivia said, I mean, that definitely we, we, we'd want to see all of these put, put together in the comments. I think they, they help us out. And if, if, the, if it's possible in a way to kind of consolidate these comments, because I know it's coming from different, um, different factors. So if we, if we don't get the same comment necessarily from every single homeowner, but if you as a community board or combined, whatever it, it needs, can, can put that together, it definitely carries, I'll say, a, a bit more weight even. Um, and, and it focuses our attention on what that comment is. Okay, so uh, we can easily, we'll easily reach out to the uh, Breezy Point is a co-op as it is Roxbury. So we will reach out to those organizations and ask them to formulate an opinion. Okay, and, and on, the, on the comment, so what we have here is a conceptual plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the thought process really is um, to address the, the flooding that goes into Jamaica Bay. Um, and, and, once, and, and making sure that we're not inducing any flooding in any of the areas. Um, so the areas of Roxbury, the areas on the other side um, uh, towards Coney Island, um, not to make sure that we're not inducing any flooding. Um, and we have uh, some plans that, that are still need to be, be developed to try to make sure that we're including some of that risk management on those areas. Mm -hmm. But there is opportunity still within our design. How can we shift that in a way that's even less um, intrusive? The, the, thing, the thing that we, we've got here, though, is that some of the constraints that we had um, is that there were underwater cables, um, underwater yes. gas lines yes. in that area. That's so correct. we tried to mm -hmm. avoid that to a certain extent. But again, if once we, once we get into design, we can we can get even more more specific as to what we can do and where we can adjust that. Okay. And then the third one, which was why did uh, Army Corps go to Community Board Two, uh, but had a request our prior request to come to Community Board Fourteen was uh, declined. Yeah, so I, I'll say, and Olivia helped me out, but uh, I mean, some of it is just our resources, just trying to make sure that we're, we're managing in a way, we're sending people out all over the place, trying to address different things. We, we don't want to um, dismiss anybody, um, but there is, there is some re realization that we only have a certain number of people working here, and we're trying to reach out to everybody at the same time. If there's months an opportunity- Months ago, months ago, not recent, months ago. We've okay. been asking for a year. Okay. Come on, every Thank agency you. loves Community Board 14. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so I'll say I'll say too. So this is why we 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 look to um, uh, Mr. Sanders here, and he put this together. If there are opportunities where we can just sit in on an existing meeting, it makes it really easier for us rather than coming out to each one. Um, it, it does take away. Right. It Cliff, takes so away. I, I got I got So Cliff, I got to take, uh, you know, borough president, uh, you know, I, I got to weigh in here. Uh, you guys should get to CB14. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be impacted. So I would just hope, you know, prior, you know, please, if you can prioritize them. Me message received. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay. And, but, and, but in the meantime, February 21st is the hearing at the Y. So Dolores, if y'all can, you know, very clear, like, let's get folks there, because that I've said, said to folks, I'm not interested in rhetoric at this point, like we need to make sure we're showing up, we're putting the comments in, and the public is showing up to their hearings, which is priority, number one. Um, but two, you, you know, uh, I will take borough president privilege here and say, you you should make it there. And I would urge that you have a full 
compliment the people at Saturday's meeting in Howard Beach. Community Board 10 has been working very closely with Mr. Gendron to make that meeting successful. And I would hope that you're gonna be there in force. Thank you. All righty. All right, did we get through all of the questions? Oh, we did good. All right. Well, I want to thank the Army Corps. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, Bo. Oh, sorry. I oh, sorry, Marie, Marie. Sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry. Um, uh, so, Cliff, I, I have a question because I know we had several meetings uh, regarding mitigation at Astoria Houses and why this is not part of, um, it, it appears not to be part of this plan. Why the Astoria Houses is not part of this plan? Well, it doesn't go into Astoria at all, but Astoria Houses in particular. Yeah, so it's great to see you again. And um, so some of the, the efforts that we were trying to do, we, we did have plans that we were looking forward to doing in that area. Um, some, of, some of them didn't materialize to the, to the extent of the, um, the, 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 the larger storms. But the more frequent storms, and that's what we were dealing with, with a lot of the Astoria houses, we were trying to protect that in a way to address the frequent flooding. Um, and we still have the opportunity here where we don't have those specified right now, but we are planning to. But again, like Olivia said, if we've left anything out, then we definitely would appreciate the comment back. And like you said, be, being that we were working there anyway, it should be reflected at least to say why we are or are not including anything in that area. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we should circle back on that uh, conversation. Um, I know that Army Corps, you were doing, um, I think y'all did some recent improvements up there, right? Am I correct, Marie? Uh, the fence, the fencing around it got completed? Yes, yes. Oh, right. right. We, we we didn't we we weren't involved in the um, right. the, the improvements that was really the city that was EDC, um, but we were involved we did a study out there and and did show that there's federal interest in looking further in that area uh, we had some support from our headquarters the, this whole thing so environmental justice has become a big thing with with our administration and we hope we we're hoping and we're pushing that it's not just an administration thing it it's a constant thing um, so we hope that that we're I, I definitely intend to keep that on for as long as we can. And we, we definitely realize that there is some um, environmental justice considerations in that area. Um, and there's opportunity for fully, fully federally funding uh, opportunities like that. So there's been a lot of hearings around the country on, on getting to that. So we were looking at, at that as the opportunity there also. Okay. Thank you. We won't let you forget. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Reverend Thorpes? Thank you, Borough uh, President. I was just, just thinking about the way Sandy came in and how we were affected. And if um, I know we don't, we don't have bodies of water that flow in like these other uh, boards do. Um, I know we do have Flush and Meadow Park with, with that body of water, but it's not. It's not. It's nothing. Anything that's heavy. The only area, um, and Borough President, you correct me if there's any area within South Jamaica that gets a flow of water like that. Um, I don't recall doing that storm hearing of any. Um, I do know in Rosedale, which is um, Mr. Block's area, the water. I've not only heard stories, but I had family members. I had friends that told me how the water came in. And will there be anything in that area as well? to protect those communities. So I could speak to Rosedale in which we're closing out the last two. So for Rosedale, really the challenge was there was no infrastructure in place. Um, so we signed off on um, the Brookville Triangle project already. Um, we just did a meeting with DEP last week with some stakeholders. So we anticipate that to start uh, next year. So that's one of the last areas that we get a lot of flooding in Rosa. And then Francis Lewis, which I'm blanking on the name of that project. So I think those are gonna largely play, um, you know, major, because where we've seen the infrastructure put in historically in places that flooded in Rosedale, and I live in Rosedale, 
there's no more flooding in those areas. So really, it's really a question of the infrastructure that doesn't exist. So that's gonna be resolved. The only other place I would say that we need to be focused on, and I think we started some conversation. Can't remember if Cliff, I mentioned York College to you, because they're pumping millions of gallons of water a day um, yeah. um, in the basement of the college. So maybe this could be an opportunity to look at um, maybe some short-term remediation around some of the challenges at York as well, which I know everybody in Southeast Queens wants to resolve. And you know we're having conversations with the city on, um, but really some long-term solutions will go a long way there. Um, and let's not right. forget the other homeowners who are also pumping water with pumps running 24 hours. Right. And, and you know, some of those questions, and, and this is something we entertain because some of these areas, you know, this project is not going to cover. How do we have conversations with the state on buyouts in some of these areas? They're, they're too low lying. It's going to be a challenge unless we get, you know, the city to agree to do pumping again, which, you know, they're not anxious to do at this point. So it's a lot of pushing forward with them still. But what I would say for some of those areas, um, you know, I think it's warrants having a, a larger conversation um, with some of those homeowners. I understand all, that with those pumps, they they said that they were going to turn them back on in 2026. Uh, they did not commit that to us because there's challenges with um, Long Island not wanting us to pump. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so it's a lot of different political challenges with getting getting the the. the you know, the Jamaica water supply to pump again. So, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll say, so, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll say that continuation story probably doesn't involve us. Um, but I, I will, I will say that the, the flooding that we saw in Rosedale uh, from Sandy, I mean, that will largely be addressed by putting that gate out right. in the Rockaways. Mm -hmm. We yep. saw a lot of that water come up Hook Creek and, and mm -hmm. flood. Mm -hmm. The Rosedale, the the Valley Stream, those, those areas from those thin creeks that that that, that spread out and go, and go up. So that that will be something that that is looking to be addressed uh, with this study. Thank you. All righty, do we get through to everybody? Okay. Seeing no more questions, comments, or concerns, we look forward to having you back. Of course, as this progresses, uh, but we want to thank you. Um, we know this has been decades in the, in the making. I think last time I, I heard about a study happening of this magnitude was like the 60s, I think. Um, and we never got anywhere, but I think there's a lot of momentum to get this done. And as uh, Chair Bratton said, you know, we have friends in Hakeem Jeffries and both Senator Schumer, um, who I know are going to be firm advocates working alongside us, and Senator Gillibrand, who actually have, uh, we'll see tomorrow actually. Uh, we'll be talking about this as well, how we can make sure we strengthen, um, continue to strengthen the infrastructure across Queens and make sure that you're fully funded, fully funded um, as we move forward. Um, so thank you so much for attending. And we're now going to go on to our last presenter. And tonight we are joined by First Deputy Commissioner Cicely Harris and Deputy Commissioner of External Relations Jillian Faison of the New York State Division of Human Rights. The Division of Human Rights enforces fair housing laws to allow everyone to have freedom of choice and be free of discrimination in deciding where they live. First Deputy Commissioner Harris will give an overview of DHR and its jurisdiction, while Deputy Commissioner Faison will present on fair housing covering how discrimination presents it, uh, its present in communities, the legal process and protection that exists to combat it. Welcome Cicely and Jillian. Good evening, good evening, good evening, um, <clears throat> Borough President Richards, Deputy Borough President Young, Board Chairs. It is my a pleasure to be here this evening with you all. Um, our Commissioner Maria Imperial gives her greetings. Um, and we are, of course, we are with DHR under the administration of Governor Kathy Hochul. On a personal note, I'm excited to be here. Um, I myself was chair of community board 10 in Manhattan for five years. I just finished in January. So uh, board chairs, I know what it feels like, the joy and the pain and the agony of all the things y'all are going through. Um, so I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Deputy Commissioner Faison and I think she's gonna do the presentation. But greetings, and if you need anything, I'll put my information in the chat. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Executive Deputy Harris. Um, so my name is Jill Faison. I'm Deputy Commissioner for External Relations. I'm so excited to be with you this evening. It was a fascinating presentation by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and although they're talking about barriers and housing, we are talking about barriers to fair housing um, and you know what the Division of Human Rights is able to provide for people in terms of redressing housing discrimination. So I just uh, wanted to thank Bro President Richards for allowing us to present to you tonight, but I also wanted to do a time check and just get a, an idea of how much time we have left because I wanna be respect, uh, respectful of people's schedules. All right, so just be clear, get to the point. I think that's okay. what most of the chairs want. Give good information and let them get their questions in. I'll just get us questions in and then we out of here. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and go very quickly straight to the point uh, and give you the info. So let's see. Okay. So can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. All right, excellent. And we're going to not do that. Why can't I start? I think you go to view, right? You're trying to turn it. I can't I see it because there we go. There we go. Yeah, okay. Okay. From the beginning, the best place to start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, the this is not even the right PowerPoint. All right. I'm going to just speak to you because I pulled up the wrong PowerPoint. This is a much longer one, and I know that's not what you're looking for. So the Division of Human Rights has four major areas of jurisdiction. So we cover employment, we cover housing, we cover education, and we cover places of public accommodation. Um, we are a law enforcement agency, and you are able to file a complaint with us, and we will investigate that complaint we will decide whether it has probable cause or no probable cause. And if we decide that there is probable cause, it goes on to a hearing and our agency is able to order remedies. So some of the remedies that we are able to order are monetary fines. They are um, trainings, things that would remediate the discrimination. And uh, there's also compensatory damages for a complainant that says, hey, I uh, applied for housing, you denied my application based on unlawful discrimination, and I had to come out of my pocket for a, either a more expensive apartment, or I had to pay for a hotel, or you know, um, other out-of-pocket expenses uh, that a complainant is putting forward. So we have many different protected classes that are under the human rights law. And that is uh, familial status, that is race, gender, gender identity, which is a, a new uh, protected class under our law we got in 2019. Uh, sexual orientation is protected, military status, disability is our number one uh, protected class in terms of the amount of complaints that we get. Um, and um, domestic violence is one that has just been passed by the legislature, as well as citizenship status and immigration status. So if you feel that your landlord or a housing provider has discriminated against you because of one of those protected classes, you can file a complaint with our agency. And I think the main point here is that rights are all well and good, only if you know that you have them, only if you know how to exercise them. And really the Division of Human Rights, um, my job with external relations is to make sure that people understand what their rights are and how to enforce them. Um, so we do small presentations to things like support groups, we do tabling, we do all sorts of community outreach 
to make sure that people understand what their rights are. And we are very excited with the opportunity of partnering with the community boards to come to your events, to plan fair housing events, um, to bring this really important information to the community. Because, um, you know, we used to see in the Craigslist uh, listings about housing, no DSS, no Section 8. Well, that's against the law. That's against the human rights law. And um, people need to understand what their rights are. And also from a landlord's perspective, a real estate broker's perspective, what their rights and responsibilities are to not, um, you know, break the law or unknowingly um, discriminate against someone that they think, oh, yeah, you know, I'm able to say, I don't want kids, you know, they on the second floor, they make a lot of noise. Um, you know, it is unlawful to discriminate against someone because of their familial status, um, you know, which would be that uh, particular example. So source of income discrimination is something we see a lot. Um, disability uh, discrimination and reasonable accommodations. Um, in New York City, you have the City Commission on Human Rights, we're the state division, and the City Commission um, enforces the city human rights law that actually has slightly more protections when it comes to disability uh, and re reasonable accommodations in, in housing, uh, because it is the landlord's uh, financial responsibility to do the reasonable modification within the unit um, under the state law, the only time that it's the landlord's responsibility to foot the bill for the reasonable accommodation is if it's in a common area. So if it's in the hallway, if it's the you know front staircase of the building, it's the elevator, um, those, those common areas would be the responsibility of the landlord. So um, I think that was as quick and dirty as I can give it to you uh, in terms of the overview. And really the, the bottom line is that um, my unit, you know, me and my staff would love to come and do a longer presentation about fair housing. And certainly we can also cover other areas of the human rights law. We do uh, presentations on employment discrimination, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, things, things of that nature um, under our jurisdiction. So Tonight we're talking about fair housing, um, but the Division of Human Rights covers, like I said, uh, the four major areas of employment, education, housing, and places of public accommodation, like a hospital um, or, or a uh, restaurant, theater, that sort of thing. So I thank you for your time and I apologize for the technical uh, difficulties with my good. slideshow, but I, I know I've been to plenty of these meetings and I'm sure you're not crying about missing. <laughs> uh, we'll um, any questions? Yeah, can you just go through? So I know one of the things we often hear is about voucher discrimination. Um, what are you seeing in Queens on that? Um, and then I guess my mind also went to the asylum seekers. So what, um, you know, can you go through now that they're here trying, trying to get acclimated into society, um, you know, what rights do they have in terms of this? Are they covered under state law as well? Absolutely. So with source of income, there are, you know, a few different ways that this crops up. Um, you know, it's it's not that often anymore that the landlord says straight out, you know, I don't accept vouchers. Um, you know, that is sort of the easiest way if you can get them recorded or in a, um, you know, email saying I don't accept vouchers, that's very easy to prove. But what we see more often and what nonprofits um, have chronicled as well is um, what they call ghosting. And, you know, you are in communication with a broker and everything is going just fine and you're sending in all the things and all of a sudden they realize you have a voucher and you don't hear anything back. Um, so there are nonprofits that do housing testing. Um, the Office of the Attorney General does housing testing. Um, the Fair Housing Justice Center does testing, um, and even the New York City Commission um, does testing as well. So for, for the state division, you know, you would just literally file a complaint, you give us whatever evidence you have, even if it is the sort of the lack of follow-up, um, but there are other entities that are able to take um, a little bit more action steps in sending out housing testers. 
and being able to to gather evidence that way. Um, I know Unlock NYC has some renters tools where you can um, you know record um, your conversations with brokers um, and file complaints. So you know that is the most often case is that you're you're um, conversing with a housing provider and once they realize you have a voucher, you don't get communication back. Um, and like I said, you can file with the division. Um, you can also flag it for Fair Housing Justice Center, or you can engage with the city commission who have housing testers um, in that way. And, um, and I guess the, the other question I had is, um, so something else we hear is like um, in some residential buildings, like requiring like you to have like 12 months of rent that goes into the deposit. Is that another way around? Uh, deposit rental or rental deposit? So they would need to, there's there's two pieces there. One would be, is, is that the way that they approach everyone? Or is it just the way they approach people with vouchers? Because okay. if they're saying, oh, you've got a voucher, so you have all of these extra um, requirements, that would be unlawful. But if everyone had to um, show that type of documentation, then it, there wouldn't necessarily be discrimination based on your source of income. This is just a crazy policy that the housing provider has. Um, but the second piece of that is if it's subterfuge, if, if you can show that the only reason that they're requiring whatever 40 times the rent um, in income, that of course, someone with a voucher is never going to have 40 times the rent in income because then they wouldn't qualify for a voucher. So that would be um, something where you would be making the argument called disparate impact. Um, and, you know, if you can show a discriminatory effect based on a, um, they call it, um, you know, undiscriminatory on its face, Right. You're just saying, you know, you have to have 40 times. Everybody has to have 40 times the the rent in income, but it has a disproportionate impact on people with a housing voucher. Um, and so that's a, a way to show discrimination. And there have been cases where if you have 100 percent of the rent, including utilities that, you know, they can they can ask you for whatever, but they can't consider it because you've got a voucher that covers all of the rent and all of the utilities. So the credit check, the, you know, has to have income, um, whatever it is, if you've got 100% of the rent and the utilities, there's really no reason besides a discriminatory reason, right, that you wouldn't be able to get that apartment. And just speak on the asylum seekers and we'll go to- Sure, quickly. Right. So um, just uh, now past is that a, a person cannot be discriminated against because of their citizenship status or immigration status. And so a situation where a landlord says, well, you know, you're undocumented or you're seeking asylum and things are, you know, unclear here. So I'm going to charge you, you know- a, a exorbitant amount of rent or require an exorbitant amount of security, or I'm not fixing your, you know, leaky sink. Those things would be unlawful under the human rights law. So treating someone differently because of their status, um, whatever that citizenship status might be, um, is unlawful under the human rights law. And I know that it's also uh, unlawful under the city human rights law as well. All right, I'll go to Renee uh, has a question. Thank you. Um, well, first, um, will you be sharing the presentation that you meant to? Um... Absolutely. Okay. Um, second is we've been we've gotten a couple of complaints of um, from seniors um, who was trying to get housing through the Housing Connect um, portal, um, the Cochran Group was handling the property and the, uh, they were charged a $20 application fee. Now, we know that the housing, um, housing Connect is supposed to be free and the Cochrane Group has, you know, has dealings all through, throughout the, the entire city. So if they are charging seniors and I don't know if the, you know who else it could be. If they're charging an application fee for something that should be free, um, 
what should be the next step in that? Is that something that you handle? So off the top of my head, it doesn't necessarily sound like housing discrimination in the sense of, you know, saying, you know, you can't live here because of your status of in a protected class. Um, but Housing Connect, is that through HRA? Yeah, HPD. Um, yeah. HPD. Okay, so then I I would flag that for HPD. Um, they, should, okay. they should know. That, right. um, and then I don't know if it's if are they applying for market rate apartments and if they're applying for market rate, that may be different than the affordable, which would affordable, be affordable, affordable housing. No, 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 but I'm just saying even with an affordable, sometimes they are market rate units. So I would just be interested in knowing are were the seniors applying for the market rate units and then them charge. I mean, I don't know, but that, I think. You know, I think this definitely warrants bringing it to the commissioner's attention. Um, yeah, um, they're, apply, they're applying for for the low income. Okay, because HPD, which I found out, they do have brokers um, who help with the lotteries, which you learn something new every day. Because I automatically thought it was the city that oversaw the process, but I would just make sure that. Um, as you proceed with HPD, just make sure. I don't know if they differentiate between a market rate unit and being able to charge. So just make sure those seniors are actually applying for the affordable. And okay, then they shouldn't thank be you. Charged. But if they if they mistakenly went for the market rate, they may get be able to get charged. I, I don't know the rules, but I think we could check with, definitely check with HPD on that. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, uh, Brian and then Reverend Thorpes. All right, thanks, I'm Mr. Brian. BP. Um, good evening, Jill. Thanks for coming. Good evening. Question, the, my question is, can a landlord, is it discriminatory if the landlord says he, he does not want children? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's familial status discrimination. Okay. The only, the only exception would be it, in like senior, 55 plus. Would that that's, be in a private home as well? A private home that's renting out? So a, a unit? the only exceptions to the human rights law are a single and two family home where the owner occupies. So, okay. um, you know, okay. one, one right. thank you. Thank you, Renee. That's what I was thinking too, Renee. Thanks, Renee. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's an apartment but on building, the vouchers, I don't think you can discriminate on the vouchers though, still, you even with the private home. No, or the, I thought, no. Oh. If you, if it's your home, you right. you can decide who lives there no matter what. Okay. Um, okay. And if okay. it's a two family, if you occupy the other unit in the connected two family, um, you know you can you can decide who lives there. Okay. But if if I own, which I don't, but if I did own an apartment building, I cannot say I don't want children. That's right. Okay. Unless Dang, it was that's... a fifty five plus community. Would <laughs> that apply? Exactly. If it was a two-family home and it was not owner occupied, what rules do they have to operate under? That is the human rights law. And yes. if it's not owner occupied, it you're just a housing provider like any other uh, yeah. landlord. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That's good to know. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. so we're clear. I'm clear. Why we do this, Reverend Thorpe's muted. Number one, I need you to come to CB12. Um, Absolutely. This inter this information is extremely needed. And because we have downtown Jamaica, CB12 has been receiving a number of phone calls where they have sent in all the paperwork to some of the buildings. You know, they've gone through the process. They sent in all the paperwork. They then are receiving a phone call or email that states you're missing something. Hmm. When they turn around and resubmit the information the same day, they immediately receive within an hour, 30 minutes, an email that states you've been um, uh, removed from the process. Just like that. HPD, is that HPD? vouchers? Or? Say again? Do you know if that's HPD? Is that the lottery or is this market rate? I, I mean, think that we need to defer. I just want to know because it's good for yeah. us. To, so, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly, but I can find out. And we've also had problems with Tree of Life, um, Alvista. We've had a, a number of complaints. 
Right. Because so through HPD and we've had similar complaints. So that's why I wanted to raise I was raising whether it was HPD because their their process clearly needs reform. And sometimes paperwork gets lost here and there. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I know they're in the process of working um, with the mayor on a new plan regarding that whole HPD connect because it's a mess. Um, I mean, it one is very hard to um, to actually operate it if you know on a regular day. So um, so we still have work to do um, with HPD on and I know city planning is looking at some reforms on on housing connect as well to make it easier for user friendly, I would say on that. But if you have uh, that, please get that to us to Reverend Thorpe's anybody who's having some complaints around some of this. So we can also flag for HPD. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. And I just put my information in the chat. Uh, Reverend Thorpes, I'll be reaching out to you. Okay. Um, and um, I will most definitely be um, submitting my presentation so everyone can uh, look through those slides. Um, and, you know, I just want to also flag for folks that if there's differential treatment, um, you know, for individuals who have vouchers, for individuals who are there, um, you know, under a, a, a assistance program where they say, okay, you know, you, you can live here in this great luxury development, but you can't use the gym or you can't, um, you know, enter through this door where, you know, there was the article about the, the poverty doors where they made people. Four doors. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Them, yep. So, you know, that's very much against the human rights law as well. So any differentiation in the way that you can enjoy uh, the services and amenities of the building based on uh, your source of income or any other protected class is also um, patently against the human rights law. Uh, Lynette, I think I saw your hand raised. I'm sorry, good evening, everyone. I, I'm kind of feeling like it was answered, but just in case, um, 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 Borough President Donovan Richards, you um, referenced HPD a couple of times, um, and many have asked questions regarding the Housing Connect process. Perhaps there's not a clear distinction, or can you, um, Ms. Jill, uh, distinguish how your services, how your agency relate to the questions that's being asked about HPD? How, do, how does it come together? I'm struggling with the formulating the question, but how does your service align with some of the requests being made on the Housing Connect um, topics? I think that maybe there's a, 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 it's not so clear. And, and it's not a natural connection because, you know, Housing Connects is a actual, um, you know, city run program um, and the Division of Human Rights um, addresses housing discrimination. So, um, city and state, is that correct? Yeah, so it's, it's city and state, you know, we're the state, um, and HBD is the, is the city. Um, but if for some reason, and, and we do go after sister state agencies, you know, no one is, um, immune, um, from, a from a discrimination complaint. So if somehow the housing connects process was, mm -hmm. Uh, disproportionately impacting or discriminating against the elderly or against, you know, um, you know, people who are um, internet illiterate, that's not a protected class. So if, you know, it, it, it's a little bit difficult sometimes with these cumbersome processes because, you know, internet savvy or, or being able to work the levers of the system is, is not a protected class. And so um, if there are operational reforms that need to happen to this Housing Connects program, that is a, a different lane um, mm -hmm. than Understood. what DHR could remedy. Understood. Um, I just have one quick question also. Um, you referenced a, a several um, other agencies. I wrote them down, oh boy. You just referenced a, a, a few other, I guess, like advocacy groups or support right. groups. If you can share that with us. And then also referencing multiple times the protective classes, if perhaps you can provide us a direction to reading out all those um, list of protective classes Absolutely. so that when we come in contact with that 
condition or situation, we're able to make the connection to what that protected class is with what we're going through. And I say we just meaning the public and the constituency in general. Absolutely. But thank you. If you can provide those references, I'm sure we can look into it and have more clarity and understanding. Otherwise, we don't know what to ask when we face with, with challenges if we're not clear about what they are. So I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And, you know, the protected classes are both in the slide deck uh, that I'm going to send. And then I have, you know, just... Um, written materials, PDFs of our trifold documents that cover all of the different, um, you know, situations and scenarios um, for housing discrimination and beyond uh, all the other areas that we cover as an agency. Brian, you have another question? Yeah, Mr. B, I'm sorry to, sorry to cut in again. Um, Jill, let's, can you file, once you file with New York City Human Rights Commission, you cannot file with the state or can you file both? It's an election of remedies. You have to choose either the, the city or the state or um, housing court. So because you can go to state court uh, you and file a housing bite of the apple. You only get one bite of the apple. Well, you can switch. You could you could file with DHR and say, you know what, I you know I want to go to state court. And there's actually a special provision that allows once a probable cause. Um, or no probable cause has has been determined. So we do the investigation, you file with us, we do the investigation, we make a decision. You can then elect to go to housing court with, you know, with that evidence um, and and use it for your case. Okay, but thank you. We, we have a process that's free. Um, you know, you don't need to pay a dime uh, to file with us. And if we determine that there's probable cause of discrimination, we actually give you an attorney. Um, for the hearing process at our agency for free. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, thank you. And uh, Jillian, if you can send us that presentation and Maricela and Khalil and company will uh, ensure we get it out to all of the chairs um, here today. So I want to thank you uh, for a great presentation. Uh, of course, I um, mean, you know, we, we missed the PowerPoint, but we'll, we'll be okay. Um, so I want to thank everybody for attending tonight's borough board meeting. I want to also thank all of our presenters and, of course, the borough hall staff uh, who put this together. I want to remind everyone that we will have an additional borough board meeting. Can't get enough of us. Uh, Monday, February 13th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, it's an important one because our budget director, Iraq uh, Chanowski, will give a presentation on the borough board budget response. Um, so once again, I will see y'all next week at 530. And if you have any questions before then, please reach out to Maricela and Khalil um, in the office on that matter. So thank you all for attending. And I want to thank all of our staff. Thank I want to thank Jordan uh, Randolph, who is now handling our events at Borough Hall. And I think this is her first borough board doing this. So I want to thank her and thank each and every one of you uh, for your continued work. Uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.